Welcome to the State of the Nation. I'm your host, Mike Sham, and joining us today is uh, the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Minister Valencosini Tlabisa. Welcome back to the State of the Nation, Minister Tlabisa. A good day, Sean, as well as the viewers of the State of the Nation. It is a pleasure to be in this studio once again after a while. It's been a while. Now, the, if we, uh, the last time you were here in person in Johannesburg, and it was just ahead of the election where we uh, were discussing the potential outcomes, the world was a very, very different place before uh, May the 29th, wasn't it? Uh, definitely, Mike. The people of South Africa delivered a new South Africa in terms of governance, but we had long anticipated it coming. That is why we did not waste time to make a decision to be part of the government of national unity because we had long prepared for a coalition government which people of South Africa delivered after the elections and said, you work together and fix our country. And your party, the, the IFP and Carter Freedom Party have really sort of stepped into uh, the government of national unity with some enthusiasm. But all of the, all of the criticisms and uh, complaints, especially from some of your multi-party charter ex-partners, has been leveled at the Democratic Alliance for doing exactly what you've done. How have you managed to stay out of uh, Herman Mashaba's crosshairs? The Action SA has a right to express its views. But you will agree with me that the Action SA at COJ, it is part of um, a coalition government. With the same partners, it is criticizing at a national level. So now it should not be when it does not suit you in terms of performance, you level criticism. But when it suits you at a certain level, you find it okay. The IFP said it, that we will have to respect the outcome of the elections. And we were willing to form a new government as the multi-party charter. But the electorate gave no option to the multi-party charter to form the government on its own or to invite anyone to form the government with it. And then we need to look at the reality as people had spoken after elections. The reality was that the existing coalition government under the term government of national unity in terms of numbers is what could work to take South Africa forward. Now, nowhere did uh, the electorate speak louder than in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, where um, I think all of us, many South Africans, barring a few people that live uh, to the north of you, were expecting, weren't expecting such an impressive dis debut performance from uh, the Mkonto with Sizwe party. And uh, they surprised all political watchers. Um, and uh, the biggest surprise was their share of the vote in the uh, provincial legislature of KwaZulu-Natal. But yet you form part of a coalition to keep them out of power. Indeed. Do you, think, do you think that represents what the voters were after? The voters with 50% plus one, the current government in the province of Wazulu Natal represents 
50% plus one of the voters, which is a majority in terms of numbers. So even if the people wanted a particular party, there is no party that got the majority. And it was essential that a coalition government must be formed. And when you form a coalition government, you don't form it for the sake of forming, but you form the coalition government if it will work for the people of South Africa. You look at the policies, you look at how the people handle themselves, and then you align accordingly. So as far as I'm concerned, in Wazulu Natal, the parties in coalition are not a minority government, but a majority government. Now, you mentioned that you, 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 you've put together a coalition of 50%, let's say 50% plus one, uh, which doesn't give you a lot of uh, wriggle room, as they say. It's a, it's a, it's a fairly precarious uh, arrangement that depends heavily on the one. And the one is the breakaway group from the IFP, uh, the National Freedom Party, with one seat. And uh, there seems to be a few uh, concerns about, uh, about their um, ongoing loyalty to the government of national unity, or, you, or to the government of provincial unity. Do you think it will hold in, uh, in KZN? Do you think NFP will stay on board? I think the NFP will stay on board. <clears throat> yes, I know there are other voices of the NFP because all organizations have some groupings. But even if the NFP can choose to work with the MK, they will not be able to form a majority government because they will not make 50% plus one. So now it will be creating a deadlock. And if you create a deadlock, you are delaying service delivery at a provincial government. So now the leadership of the NFP to agree to join the 50% group was a good thing to do because they delivered a majority government. And I am of the view that they will hold on in that majority government then creating a deadlock which will delay service delivery and people might punish the NFP that you had an opportunity of forming a majority government and you decided to form a deadlock where decisions are not taken going forward. So now that is the conviction which makes me that uh, the NFP reading the political scenario very well will stay in the provincial government in Wazulu Natal. Now, Minister Tlebisa, with the arrangements that have happened down in KZN and also in Etiquini, where the government uh, of national unity has filtered down, have the residents, the of and the the taxpayers of those regions felt the benefit of uh, of this arrangement compared to what they had before in other words is your provincial government doing its job is the city of etiquini in a better position now than what they were three months ago it will take some time mike <clears throat> as you know that um, a new mayor if i'm not mistaken this will be his second month. We will need to give him some space to come with his turnaround plan. The team, Etewini presidential working team, I was part of a meeting a month ago where they presented the progress made 
together with the intervention by the provincial government of KwaZulu Natal, I'm, I, I'm hopeful that in a very short period as we go forward, there will be tangible changes. The thing is, it doesn't happen overnight. And the, the president and the whole national government will be in Deben in November on an imbizo where we will be engaging all stakeholders, business people, civil society, the residents of Etiwini, as a way of gauging if there is any change up to November, but also the mayor will be laying out a very clear plan how he will fix things in a very short space so that we can win once again the trust, hope, and confidence of the people of Etiwin. Now, if that is, uh, is uh, a recipe for success, the same courtesy hasn't been extended to, uh, to the residents of uh, Gauteng, where that um, same spirit of unity hasn't translated in any changes either in the Gauteng Provincial Legislature where nobody got a majority or in some of the cities that are rapidly catching Etiquini up in terms of poor service delivery. We've got streets exploding, we've got people dying in buildings, um, we've got uh, suburbs where the roads are being returned to dust. Uh, and that spirit of unity which we saw on show at national level and in KwaZulu-Natal was not extended to Gauteng. The position of the IFP has been confusing to me because you seem to be quite happy that uh, one of the main uh, GNU parties has been excluded from uh, the situation in Gauteng. What's your view on what's going on in Gauteng? Because you've been, uh, your party has taken up positions with the people in the ANC that do not want to include your partners. The IFP is an independent political party that takes decisions on its own views, assessments, and reasons. We are not a combo with any political party. Where we agree, we agree, and when we don't, we do not agree. Now, it is something common. Even if you look at other coalition governments, like for instance, if you go to Germany, you will find a different alignment of political parties at a local government sphere, a different alignment at a provincial sphere, and a different alignment at a national level. Now, what happened in Gauteng is not something strange in coalition government that while the 10 parties are working together nationally, but in the province of Gauteng adopts a different combination. Why the IFP came on board is because, as I said, we are a party on its own right. The challenges between the ANC and DA are challenges between the two political parties, not with the IFP. That is why, therefore, in the interest of people, we will always go what is best for the people of South Africa or the province of Gauteng. Well, I can speak uh, from uh, the position of uh, one resident of Gauteng and say that uh, if you think this is good governance, then uh, maybe we've got bigger issues to discuss. But uh, let, let's move on to the question of governance, because this is obviously your portfolio. And recently, the Auditor General came out with her report, 
uh, and it's been a scathing report on uh, the performance that our Auditor General Tsukani Maluleki came out with about uh, the, you know, the municipal reports from the Auditor General's perspective. Where out of 257 municipalities, 34 received a clean audit. It's down from 38. Now, this is your portfolio. And uh, if, I, if I can kick off with this, I do understand that this is historic numbers and it's uh, probably more reflective of your predecessor's uh, tenure in the position of, uh, um, you know, uh, in this portfolio of cooperative governance. But you get to oversee this. And if one starts, you know, um, what do they say? Charity begins at home. How have the IFP done in the municipalities that they run? Are they getting clean audits? Amongst the 34 municipalities that got clean audit, <clears throat> there is King Zajwayo district under the control of the IFP, Umlalazi local municipality under IFP, and the city of Umlatuze. You will understand for a city got the clean audit. Although we would have loved to get more numbers falling under the category of clean audit, quite a number of our municipalities are in a category of unqualified report with matters. We are satisfied, but we want to do more in terms of accountability because a good audit outcome does not necessarily mean you are doing well in service delivery, but it means at least in terms of accountability, transparency, and systems, you are able to use the resources on behalf of the community in a very good manner. We welcome the audit report as presented by the AG and we noted a decline with four from 38 to 34, but we also noted the improvement of the worst audit outcome category, the disclaimer from 22 to 12, which is a good thing, bad as it may. And also, if you look at the number of um, the qualifications in terms of municipalities, the number shows improvement. As a result, <clears throat> the cabinet resolved that let us make the functionality of municipalities a collaborative effort. Because if you want to see the growth of economy, it will grow at a municipal level. There is no boat who lives at a provincial level or national level. We all live in a municipality in a certain world. So if you get things right at a municipality level, you will have more people wanting to come and invest in South Africa. If things are okay at a, a local government level, water, electricity, potholes are fixed, and all services are available on time, you will see more people wanting to visit South Africa, wanting to invest in South Africa, and the economy will therefore grow, job opportunities, and the unemployment will be decreasing. Now, we have agreed as COGTAM on a turnaround plan. This afternoon at two o'clock, a meeting with the ministers from other departments, water and sanitation, electricity, human settlement, Treasury, because these departments are key departments to make municipalities functional. And we are going to adopt 
a collaborative approach so that we bring a turnaround in a short space of time. And this turnaround plan will be tabled before cabinet in the middle of October. And it is having time frames. Four months, there are critical things. We want to see them changing. Six months, we will be observing closely to dysfunctional municipalities and want to see a turnaround, a change. 12 months, we must have a better outcome in terms of the performance of our municipalities. And this will require support from us, but cooperation from municipalities. And we will do a close monitoring and the message to our municipalities is very clear. It cannot be support, support, support. There must be change. You can't just give support, but don't see outcomes or change thereafter. So now, consequence management will be an order of the day. Because if we have given you support, cooperate and produce results. If you don't cooperate, we will embark on drastic measures to enforce the change we want to see. Okay, so that uh, those measures that you are, are are going to impose in terms of consequence management, would that be aimed at the at the party in charge or the individuals in charge? Will we see people being held to account using the PFMA or the MFMA? Uh, what is that consequence management? Uh, I'm going to ask this question in two parts. And if that is the case in the municipalities that the IFP are currently running, have you has there been consequence management in those places where you didn't get desired outcomes? The IFP is one political party that has replaced some mayors since 2021 and other office bearers deployed when we are not satisfied about their conduct. The consequence management is gonna be in terms of the MFMA, because we cannot interfere with political parties except to bring the report to the attention of the political parties involved that you sort out your political leadership when we sort out the administrative component of a municipality. Because for a municipality to function, it boils down to leadership, both administrative and political. If you zoom in in the 34 municipalities with clean audit, they have the administration which knows what it is doing and the political leadership that also knows what it is doing. Now, you mentioned uh, a couple of, uh, in, in your discussions later today, a couple of stakeholders that are key to getting any municipality to, to, to run efficiently. And it sounds like a great initiative. The one uh, group I didn't hear being uh, around that table is law enforcement. Because obviously, if we've got such a bad record of financial management, there's also some malfeasance that happens. But we hear very little about um, our um, entrusted leaders, people that are entrusted to use our money wisely and who don't, ending up in uh, your other coalition partner, Mr. Uh, Mr. Grunewald's clutches at correctional services. So clearly there's a, there's a disconnect because if the downside to me doing something badly or maybe doing something illegal is that I just lose my job, yeah, it's worth the chance, isn't it? As I said, consequence, consequence management is going to be the order of the day. We will be making a follow-up 
on the audit outcomes as to the implementation of what was raised by the Auditor General, where criminal cases should have been open, we will demand, if the municipalities have not done so, that you do so and give us evidence and follow up those cases so that we send a clear message that if you don't do the right thing, you will end up on the wrong side of the law. And where it requires internal disciplinary pro processes, we will want to know how far the municipality has gone in terms of discipline to members of the council who might have slept on duty. Will this kind of information be made public, Minister? Will we be able to, to monitor? Will we be able to see names of people who haven't done their jobs? After all, it is our money that they are spending. So, you know, uh, you, you, you want sight of this. You don't want to say we, it's a disciplinary <clears throat> issue, we're doing it in-house. What is, the, we, what is we, your we, take on the transparency here? We will make this transparent because we are quite clear we are dealing with the public money and we also want to send a clear message to the public that if you do something wrong, you will have to meet the consequences of your actions. Well, you know, that really, really encouraging. And I would uh, immediately point you towards some uh, metros in Gauteng that used to be the heartbeat of South Africa in terms of its economy, which is clearly being mismanaged, but uh, nobody seems to be uh, terribly interested in doing anything about it. They seem to be dead scared to do anything about it. Uh, part of the problem that we have, and it's become a national issue, is this issue of mafias, which are definitely going to be part of the discussion that you will have later on. Um, you know, how insidious is this problem of mafias across a number of in industries, a number of, uh, of uh, competencies within municipalities and metros? Yes, indeed. Um... This is a, a matter of great concern in the country. And what is good, the government has taken a stance that enough is enough. And we will rely heavily on the state security apparatus to ensure that um, the problem of the mafias is cracked down so that projects that must be undertaken, a person who won the tender in a free and fair tender process must be given an opportunity to execute and implement the project, not to be hold ransom by the mafias, as the case has become in our country, and I hope the intervention by the Minister of Police is appropriate to deal with this um, kind of behavior. Now, Minister, as part of, uh, of your portfolio, uh, do you have any say in, uh, in whether um, bylaws are, are actually implemented? Is this monitored in any way? Because I'm yet, you know, the, it's obviously barring, I suppose, the city of Cape Town, one sees a complete collapse of the implementation of bylaws. Certainly in the Gauteng metros, the only time you see a metro policeman is at a roadblock. We see uh, bylaws being flouted every day, you know, people walking in the streets, um, uh, begging at traffic lights, etc. when it's clearly we have bylaws for that, people putting up shacks where, where, the, where the bylaws preclude that. Economic activity, not, not 
happening in accordance with bylaws. But I hear about auditing, I hear about, uh, you know, water and sewerage, etc. But this all begins and ends with bylaws, doesn't it? Yes. <clears throat> the municipalities will be encouraged to effectively use the bylaws they have because almost all municipalities do have the bylaws. The only problem is the political will to implement the bylaws. And where we will realize that there is resistance in terms of fixing minor problems. Oopsie daisy. Have been through Schedule 6B under MIG programs where we have compelled all municipalities that they must spend 10% of their MIG allocation to ensure that um, repairs and maintenance is at an acceptable standard and where there are leakages, those leakages are fixed timelessly. And once again, will this be in a transparent way? Will we be able to see uh, what, uh, how that process is shaping out? I mean, I haven't seen bylaws being uh, adhered to in, in years, in decades. Uh, you know, I what know. kind of feedback can, uh, can, can we expect from your department? Now, on that score, we will make this information public when we start the intervention um, in municipalities, like for instance, we are using Schedule 6B at Otugela as well as Mfuleni. You know the history of Mfuleni, how they perform. That is why we have jumped in in order to speed up the process. Now, Minister, to talk Turning back to uh, to the national picture, you are now a, a, in a senior cabinet post in a government of national unity, and that government of national unity is facing its first uh, real challenges. Uh, we have, you know, if, if this was a, a comedy movie, we couldn't have scripted it any better, but we've got massive question marks around the conduct of the Minister of Justice this is the same minister that's withholding information from the, the investigative unit that they can follow up on, on state capture cases. And there is no doubt that, uh, much like the allegations last year that emerged against the president, that there's a case to be answered here. But it seems like uh, the ANC are going to do ANC things by trying and bury this under a whole lot of process, and we'll come back to you and everything will be resolved in time. Do you think this uh, potentially could destabilize the government of national unity? What's the IFP's position on the Minister of Justice, Tembi Simolani's um, uh, situation? Hey, Mike, I, I would really <clears throat> like to respect the minister not to talk about that matter in this platform because she is my colleague at a cabinet level. The president is seized with the matter, and I believe he will handle it accordingly. And you think that uh, the, the taxpayers and voters in South Africa <clears throat> do not deserve the same courtesy? The president will take the nation on board once, because he is the one who appoints and also withdraws um, ministers. Once he has dealt with the matter, I believe he will take the Bureau of South Africa on board. I think I will need to respect the fact that she is my colleague at a cabinet level. Um, <clears throat> to comment more on the matter might not be a right thing to do, instead leave the president to do what is due in terms of the matter. 
if uh, if situations like that occur and uh, it's contrary to the the IFP's way of looking at uh, these situations, would you consider um, would it would it quest would it would it put your con <coughs> continued uh, uh, participation in a government of national unity at risk? The government of national unity is like a marriage. You do not agree on anything and every approach. But like a marriage, you went beyond issues of differences in the sake of keeping the family together. So now the issue to me is not a big issue for the GNU. It is a matter of the president and the minister to hang it. Yeah, I, I, I understand that I, I'm putting you in a difficult position, but we are not talking about an insignificant portfolio here. We talk about the Minister of Justice. We talk about somebody who is purposely withholding information to the investigative unit so that they can prosecute uh, state capture cases. I mean, this isn't just a theoretical problem here. Yeah, the, this, is, this is structural. Here we've got a minister who's trying to block investigations for corruption uh and uh you know so it's the, the the stakes are pretty high or do i have that right wrong no mike <clears throat> i i did listen to the minister when she was talking about the issue in relation to information and the point she drove through was that she doesn't have any information which is known exclusively by her or held exclusively by her. So now, on that score, I will not be able to comment on the issue of the NPA and the minister and the president knows exactly what the minister should be doing in the ministry and he will be the right person to give a solution on the matter as there are many accusations leveled against the minister. Moving along, uh, another another hurdle for the government of national unity to deal with is uh, is twofold. Uh, one bit of legislation that was passed uh, literally days before the election, and that was the National Health Insurance Act, and now the Bella Bill that uh, the the Basic Education Amendment Bill, which uh, President Ramaphosa said he's uh, signing into law. Uh, a, and this is again some strong protests. Where do you stand on the Bella Bill? The IFP engaged the Bella Bill and pointed out things which it was not happy about. Like for instance, the sale of alcohol in school premises, such issues eventually got removed from the final bill which was approved in parliament. In a situation of give and take, we were of the view that you can't get it all. Uh, if some of the things were concerned have been changed, you need to demonstrate that you were constructive, not destructive. And we eventually supported the Bella Bill. I am confident that even on issues where some members of the GNU may not see eye to eye on the Bella Bill, we still have an opportunity now to bring education together. As we are demonstrating in the Government of National Unity where we are able to meet each other halfway, agree to disagree, find a compromise to take our country forward, I am confident, even in the case of the NHI, 
the IFP voted against the NHI, but we expressed it clearly that we are of the view that the access to quality health care should be available to every South African citizen. But the NHI as it stands does not look it's going to deliver such. That is what we are going to engage within the government of national unity. Because if you are in a coalition government, you need to compromise, adopt a win-win attitude because no single one won. I am sure the ruling party, the leader of the GNU, will create an opportunity to engage on these matters so that we strike a balance and take our country forward. So pass the bills now, despite the fact that there's massive opposition and they probably won't pass constitutional muster and fight later. Is that the attitude we're going to take? The bill was passed in the previous administration. And then now it is up to the president. As I said, the doors of engagement should remain open. Because if you find a common ground, you can take the bill back to parliament for the ratification of the areas where you have made an agreement on. It is not a custom stone. Once the act has been passed, you can still interrogate it and bring sense and logic and produce evidence of what you're talking about. So now <clears throat> on NHI, we are willing to engage as IFP with the government and <clears throat> similar issues in the Bella bill needs a joint discussion by all parties who are affected in order to have a product which we will proudly say it will take our children forward. Minister Valencasini Tlabisa, you've been uh, a great guest. Thank you so much. Good luck in what you're trying to achieve. Uh, it would be wonderful if we could get some kind of better governance down at local level and all power to you, sir, in everything you are trying to achieve there. And thank you so much for joining us on the State of the Nation. You've, uh, you, you know, you've always been willing to, uh, to be on the show, so it's great to have you here. And, uh, you know, we support you. everything that you're doing and we look forward to that transparency. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mike and your viewers and all the times I will be willing and available to engage with your audience in this studio. And out of interviews, we learn a number of things uh, out of the questions you raise, which help us to go and rectify those areas. Thank you very much, Chair. Mike. Well, what you learn is that there's a very angry guy up in, in Joburg about the way the city is being run. Yeah, and I no, no, no. I, re I really took note on that one. Um, yeah. And um, how then houses, metros that are key in the economy of our country. That is why we cannot afford to allow Gauteng and its metros to deteriorate because it will erode our economy and unemployment will grow uncontrollable. It sure will. And just a reminder to everybody that's joined us, this episode was brought to you by Pace Car Rental. They drive us forward. We need their cars. We need their four by fours to... Uh, to manage the streets of Joburg. So thank you so much to Minister Tlabisa. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. We're growing along nicely. And uh, Minister Tlabisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, Mike and your viewers.